Here we are today. Um, I'm going to start off by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So um, great turnout. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you know, being an early stage startup inherently is full of uncertainties. Um, teams often new. You're kind of figuring out how to work together just to start to build this amazing business. Um, your product is just getting off the ground and finding exactly where you fit in the marketplace can sometimes take a lot of trial and error and sales are new. So we don't really have a track record, track record of what's happened in the past to start to predict the future. So there's a lot of uncertainty and it can often feel like there's all these odds that are just stacked against you um, because of that. But there are some things that are certain. One, the number of VCs specifically targeting early stage startups has grown significantly since 2019. We've got great players such as Galileo, Tidal Ventures and Folklore Ventures all coming onto the scene to support early stage startups. Um, the number of angels in Australia is growing rapidly. Um, for those who don't know, angels are high net wealth individuals who have the financial capacity to invest in startups, um, often at very early stages. Um, so we've got organizations like LaunchFix directly funding angel networks. We've got um, the Airtree Explorer program to help people begin their angel investment journey, which Jace, I'm sure, can chat to as well. Um, and obviously, while 2020 wasn't the year for early stage investment, in fact, seed funding dropped 15 percent from 2019. Um, Q1 in 2021 has seen the highest number of investments in early stage startups since 2018. So it feels like we're truly on our way back and the ecosystem is looking up. Um, you know, funders, funding is growing massively. Um, but as an early stage startup, how can you start to harness some of that momentum? How do you prepare for your first early stage funding round or maybe it's your second? Um, and how do you actually just put your best foot forward? So I thought it was time that we brought together some incredible experts um, who I'm really excited um, they live and breathe this stuff every day. Um, but before I get to introing them, sorry to like leave you on the edge of your seat, um, <laughs> everyone. Um, I'm Josh. I'm the head of labs at Luna. For those of you who don't know what we do, we are a legal accounting and um, education firm to help and support startups along their journey. Um, before we jump into, jump things, into things, a little bit, a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, I can hear myself. What is going on? As um the webinar is going to run until 1 30 p.m um so we're going to like continue until then if you have questions i'd love to hear them please use the q a um down the bottom of your screen um to ask any questions um if you after the session we're going to be sharing recording and any resources that are mentioned today um, we'll also be live tweeting the event. Um, so feel free to get involved. Nikita is going to share everyone's details in the um, chat. Um, so you have that on hand and ready to go. Um, now, on to the much more exciting part about today um, and less of the Zoom keeping, so to speak. We've got three incredible panelists with a really diverse range of experience. First up, we have Cheryl. Cheryl is an extraordinary supporter and player in the ecosystem. She's a startup advisor, angel investor with 13 investments. Has that grown since we last chatted? 13 investments under your belt? I think so, yeah. We might be at 14 now. 14 investments, huge. Um, and national head of community. At Including Stone cake. Stone. <laughs> Including cake. Oh, love it. <laughs> um, I love it. Um, and if you don't, if you're not connected with Cheryl, um, I can say it's probably one of the most valuable things you can do as an early stage startup founder. <laughs> um, just, just if you just look at her amazing list of resources, I think that's a great place to start. <laughs> um, next up, we have Jace, who's the CEO of Cake. Um, Jace not only understands the startup ecosystem by virtue of being a startup yourself, but you've been previously an accountant, VCFO in the space, um, and you have amazing oversight also into the data that's coming through the ecosystem about raising and things like that through Cake. So thanks for coming along. And then finally, we have Emma. Emma is our head of legal at Luna. She has incredible experience and started kind of at a top tier firm, um, but fortunately made the switch to come and support startups and works with players across the ecosystems from angels to VC startups to scale up to support them 
um, across their journey. Um, so everyone with here has diverse, interesting experience to help us start to understand um, a little bit about and get different perspectives on um, how you can um, support your own, your own journey into getting some early stage funding. Um, so first, maybe we'll start with Cheryl. Cheryl, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about how you got to be where you're at today? <laughs> what, how, how did you become this extraordinary collector um, and purveyor of information? Well, first of all, I'm one of those optimistic people that's like glass overflowing kind of optimistic. So it just kind of served me well that, you know, when startups come to pitch me, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, thankfully, I have uh, an other half in life and in business who is a bit more pessimistic and likes to look at the financials so he can sense check things for me. Um, but look, my journey started pretty much. I didn't really have a choice. Uh, my parents started a company back before the word startup wasn't a sexy or cool. And so I was born into it and uh, never really had a choice in the matter. Um, when I was in Australia, I started a company called StartCon and we ran the largest startup and growth conference in Australia as well as, well as the largest pitch competition across APAC. Uh, so that pretty much kickstarted my journey into the startup ecosystem here in Australia and allowed me to meet all of the amazing people from um, the Fishburners team all the way to uh, you know the Blackbird team and uh, all of the startups in between. So it's been a really wild journey and I've had a lot of fun doing it. That's awesome. And Jace, I see you flicking in and out. Um, just give me a holler if you're here. I'd love to hear about- Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here, man, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd love to hear about your journey into the space. What, what prompted you to get involved working with startups in the first place? Yeah, look, I- um... I'm just a big picture guy. I'm super excited about the future. And um, I got to a certain age and I had some kids and I thought, wow, you know, like I've just got to like stand up and build the future that I want to see, you know, which sort of sounds, might sound like a little bit, a little bit wild, but like that's actually literally true. So um, I chucked in my sweet job and went and just hustled hard for a few years to work out what was going on in the startup space and on the Gold Coast, you know, like it was a pretty wild induction. Like they, like it was pretty hard here. Like there wasn't that much knowledge and experience here. And then slowly I, I met some cool people in Brisbane, like River City Labs and, and the BDO for startups guys in Brisbane are really cool. And then, um, yeah, about probably about 18 months ago, I, I, um, and like early on, I met people like Cheryl who helped me a lot. I think Cheryl was one of my earliest supporters as she has been for lots of companies. Um, and it's people like that that are like just berserk, full of energy and um, experience that help the really, really early stage founders. And I want to be one of those guys, you know. So, um, and my co-founder Kim, he's equally passionate about innovation, and entrepreneurship. So yeah, and then so we got onto cake, the cake thing, the cap table problem. It was like super broken. It's really, really hard to work out what to do with your equity when you're a founder. And we just wanted to like 10x simplify it. And I think we've gone a long way towards doing that. You know, along the journey, I've got to do cool stuff like recently Cake did, did Startmate, which is just the most incredible experience of people and learning and whatever. And yeah, I did the Etri Explorer program recently as well, which is about like teaching people to how to angel invest. So, so yeah, it's just been, um, it's been awesome. And now we work right across the ecosystem. I think we've got like a hundred partners and, <laughs> and everybody's just committed to helping startups. So yeah, I'm pretty fortunate. Ah, I love that. Thanks, Jace. And Em, do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe some of the work you do with startups and a little bit of your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Josh mentioned, I um, head up the legal team at Luna. We've got a few different arms, labs, where Josh is, accounting and legal on the one route. So I started my legal career in a very traditional sense, working on the big Holland Streets law, law firms. Um, that was great training, great experience, but I was working with really big, you know, ASX listed companies, um, you know, really um, learning a lot, but I, I quickly discovered there was this world of startups, this whole ecosystem that I had, I didn't know anything about, but I quickly realized it was, I wanted to get a, a, a part of it and be a part of it pretty quickly. So about almost three years ago, I uh, made the jump to join the Luna team when we were actually a lot smaller back then, we were a startup ourselves. So being a part of that startup journey growing the legal team, growing the Luna team. Um, and as a legal team, we work with startups all across the, the startup lifestyle. So uh, life cycle, so early stage founders who are setting up their first company, getting their first um, contracts, customer client contracts in place, all the way through to, you know, really large investments, series A, series B, 
and the ultimate exit as well, where a startup can actually sell sell their company. And we do everything in the middle as well, you know, employee incentives, employee agreements, trademarking, um, anything that a startup might need. Yeah, so um, we also work with investors as well as startups. So it's good to see, um, get some insights to that side of the coin as well and understand what really makes investors tick and what they look for in a startup. I love it. Thanks, Em. You know, I just want to say it's like super weird for me to be interviewing you three because I've had like the most casual, awesome conversations with each of you individually. And now it's like we're having like an interview anyway. I'll, I'll, we'll go into that another time. Um, I wanted to maybe just get a uh, quick, Cheryl, maybe do you want to tell us like 2020 early stage investment? What kind of, what was happening? I, I reeled off some statistics before, but like I, I'm keen to hear your thoughts. What, what was happening there? Yeah. So actually it's funny that I said that I was super optimistic because I was one of those people at the start of 2020 who was like, you're all screwed. Um, <laughs> you should raise now because there's not going to be any money in, in 18 to 12 to 18 months. Um, thankfully I was completely wrong and there's more money now than ever. Um, but yeah, at the start of 2020, I think there was so much speculation and um, pessimism and a lot of people very, very concerned about what was going to happen to their own portfolio. So people were speculating that essentially all of the investors would be like, we have to pump money into our portfolio company so we don't have fresh money to invest in new ones. Um, so there's a ton of speculation there. There are many angels that I think did pull back uh, in kind of the early, for the first half of 2020 that said, okay, well, I, I'm going to see how it goes. Uh, but that turned around fairly quickly. Uh, <laughs> I think Australia in particular, but also globally, we're now seeing like, as we go, as we get into 2021, that like that has completely turned around. So I'm actually really glad that, you know, we didn't have that huge fallout. <laughs> Me too, to be honest. Jace, do you have a similar view on like what was going on in 2020 from Cake's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like February, March happened and everybody went like, super conservative and it was like raise as much as you can and from from an actual transaction perspective we saw like in april and may like absolutely nothing happened like it was only sort of like investments going into like just save like the companies that portfolio like that were already in portfolios but then it really bounced back quickly i think by june july august like it was on again and so we were just so so glad as a startup but also for our customers and and the ecosystem that the bounce back was so fast. And, and then now I've just seen it accelerating, which is even better. Em, are you feeling like 2021 is a better year, more positive, more positive from an investment perspective? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And completely echo what these guys are saying. There was this last year, this kind of like freeze where everyone had inward focus. But I think the second half of last year was actually really promising and we kind of weren't really expecting it. Um, but we found ourselves as a Luna team working on across heaps of investments in the second half. And it was just really exciting. I think that's definitely carried over to the start of this year, looking at lots of different investments. The, I think that things have slightly changed a little bit. Like investors are definitely more focused on the use of funds and having that runway and making sure the startup is really going to use those funds properly and it's going to make the distance. Um, but that's definitely a promising start to the year. Awesome. And I guess like, so investments looking up, but maybe to start with the age-old question, how do I actually find investors? Cheryl, I want to go to you first because you've got the resource. You've, you, you're a collator of resources. What do you call it? The first time we met, you had this specific term for your, for how you collate resources. I love it. I just make lists of lists because I tend to be that person where I'm like, I, I've, got, I've got a guy or girl for that. So people will come to me and be like, hey, I'm, like, I'm looking for this. I'm like, okay, well, here's the six things. And just to make my own life easier, I just started making lists of things so that next time somebody asked, I could be like, copy, paste, go. Um, and, and so that's kind of how my big list of startup support resources uh, was born. So I do maintain a list. Um, it's funny, like for all the fancy things that there are out there, uh, I've seen that just a Google Doc with a bunch of links has been one of the more popular things. Like I really didn't think that that was going to be so popular because um, there's so many more amazing, like beautiful, well laid out um, websites that have uh, much better UX than a Google Doc. But uh, yeah, it's it like routinely. Like, if I open it right now, there'll probably be 20 people looking through it. Uh, so if you do want to um, find it, somebody will paste the uh, paste the link in the chat for you. Um, but yeah, so look, I think that is one of the things that I do is pull together lists. And one of those is investors. Uh, so you'll have a whole section there around um, different investors. 
and collated resources. I think it's under like reports um, and directories section. Um, and a lot of those are actually just lists of other, uh, other people's lists. So I've kind of brought them all together. I think it really depends which type of investor that you're looking for. So there's plenty of lists of all the different VCs in Australia online, um, many of which are listed there from, from my document. But you need to start by understanding how much are you looking to raise and from who. So looking for angels is a very different activity than looking for VCs and looking for big institutional funding with a $5 million check is a bigger and completely different one as well. So thinking about where, who you're actually looking to raise from and starting from that point of view could be a really great starting point. And then once you start going to look at lists, then you know what you're looking for. Totally. I think it's, it's such an interesting point to starting, starting to be a bit more targeted about about who you're reaching out to because from what i'm hearing cheryl there's like thousands of there's thousands of line items about who could potentially invest in your business jace have you have you have you had a similar experience you know finding people who are aligned to your to to what you're doing and what your aims are yeah look we've done a few raises ourselves and i've managed a few raises and um like I work with accelerators uh, as a mentor. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about this as Cheryl does. And I'm, I'm sure the Airtree open source investor list is, is one of Cheryl's lists. You know, it's like a great place to start. Um, but yeah, like I think, you know, what I would normally say is get whatever list you can get your hand on, cut them down. So what industry do the people invest into? So do a bit of homework first. It's really quick. It just takes like an hour or two. So you'll have, might have a list of two or 300 investors, cut them down to people that invest in your niche, they invest in your stage. So then you might end up with 50. And that is a great number of investors to start from when you're wanting to raise. And then the only other thing I wanted to add is like, there's this great concept in early stage capital raising, which is like be a line, not a dot, right? So what I mean by that is when an investor first meets you, you're a dot, like that's the one bit of information they have about you. They're not going to invest in that. Like once you've met them two or three times or you've sent them your monthly update two or three times, then you become a line, you know, the connect, connection between those, those dots, those interactions you've had with them before. So one of the big mistakes I see um, founders making is like they'll make a list and they'll do all this work and then they'll go and pitch them and they'll be like, hey, give me money, you know? Like you've got to build these relationships. So as soon as you can, um, yeah, make, make those connections uh, if you don't know them that well, just email them, get a connection, send them your updates, and then yeah, you got so much better chance of getting that funding done when you need it. Cheryl, do you think any time, any like, is there any point when like reaching out is too early, or do you think the earlier you can start building relationships, the better? Yeah, it like don't go reaching out to Macquarie Capital when you've got an idea. Um, <laughs> like that is definitely too early. Most of the big VCs like Squarepike, Airtree, Blackbird, um, Title, they, they'll all say like too early. There's no such thing as too early for us. Uh, I think that they're they absolutely want you to reach out early and start that relationship with them. But there's definitely a caveat there. And, you know, if you're reaching out and wasting their time, then that's not going to go over well. And I think if you are approaching the wrong person at the wrong time, then that's also not going to go over well. Uh, so really, again, it comes back to like, think about who, what, what money you need. If you need a hundred, if you need a hundred thousand dollar check, like you're probably not going to go and get that from Blackbird tomorrow. But if you need a hundred thousand dollar check and you reach out to a couple of angels that invest in that particular space, that's going to be a much better approach for you because then they might be able to help you go reach out to Blackbird afterwards when you need that $500,000 check. Totally. I love that. So being a little bit strategic as well. And like on the strategy front, M, if I want to raise money, how far in advance do I have to start like thinking about it? Because obviously yeah. like no one invests on a first date. No one, no, uh, like, you know what, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, and I think you need at least six months and it might sound like a really long time, but even longer sometimes, because as these guys are saying, as Cheryl and Jason are saying, it's, it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen on the first time you, you know, pitch your idea to a VC or an angel. So you've got to really put in some time to build those relationships, build those connections and really, you know, prove to those investors that you have a good team, that you have a business that's going to really be worth investing in. Um, so once you've kind of built that traction and really proven that you, you might be able to get some verbal commitments from investors, which is fantastic, but then you've got the whole legal processes, which is where we step in. Um, and, you know, like the legal documents sitting behind an investment can take anywhere from a few weeks 
or a few months, really depending on the complexity and the number of investors and the type of investors you're bringing on. So if you're going with something like a convertible instrument that can be like so a safe or a convertible note, that might be able to get across in a few weeks and get done pretty quickly. Um, but if you're going down the more traditional equity path, which is a traditional um, investment for in exchange for shares in a company, then you're probably looking at you know a month or two to get that all the all the documents across the line before the money can get in the bank account. Um, so there are a few processes, and you'd be better off starting earlier along along the track before you need the money, so you're not really racing at the end to get money in the bank account. Jace, we're getting these um, some of these questions that have come through, for example, from Bianca uh, about you know, how to like, how, what you should do when you're like seeking investment. I think it like brings up the question of like when, when you're like pre-revenue and seeking investment, I guess it brings up the question of traction for me. Maybe, can you describe just like what, what traction is um, and like why, how do I like start to demonstrate that if I'm like ideal pre-revenue or anything like that? Yeah, so pre-revenue round. So you're probably talking pre-seed or seed. Like you can sometimes get away with the seed when you're pre-revenue, but it's, you know, but really probably talking about the first round. So it could be called friends and family, could be called pre-seed. It's probably more, more the latter these days. Um, you normally wouldn't have any actual revenue at this point. Um, you sh should always have some sort of beta or prototype or MVP when you're raising. Like it's a bit hard to go out to people you don't know and get money when you haven't got any sort of product. So I think the first step is make sure you've got some product if it's just a prototype, then you're talking about customer interviews, customer feedback, like some sort of um, learning process that you've been through, positive responses back from customers. Um, ideally, you've got some sort of beta product that's been in their hands and you can actually get like real feedback. Um, also, sometimes things like waiting lists or, or pre-sales or so you're looking for some sort of validation um, from customers over time that might be growing that show that there's demand for what you're doing and that you have the ability to find that demand, you know, and get the messaging right and capture it. Then when you get to the seed stage, which is the next round, so then you've got to think, well, my milestones normally need to be a little bit further along. So at this stage, you're probably talking some sort of revenue. If not revenue, definitely some sort of customers that are retained and likely to potentially upgrade. So you're looking for that next level of traction. Um, you know, and then obviously the later stage, like Series A, definitely you need to be having revenue. So that's like, you know, roughly 1 million in ARR for a Series A, plus or minus, of course. But, you know, then you really need to be having actual customers, retention, fast growing, recurring revenue, um, you know, double digit month for month growth with your revenue and your customers and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I think there's a bit of a, a progression between those stages. Um, but yeah, the very early stage traction doesn't have to be you know, actual customers or revenue, which I think is good for people to know because, you know, you kind of want to get that first round done as early as you can. Um, Cheryl, you're investing a lot of like, um, like startups vary in stage, but um, like at the earlier, earlier stage of someone's journey, right? I do, do you agree? Do you agree with that? Like traction is like maybe just improvement over time. Honestly, my biggest traction metric as to whether to invest in a startup in the early, very early stages is how many customers have you talked to and how have you synthesized that research? Uh, so you can talk to a hundred customers and not be able to show me anything. So like no documentation of that. You just say, well, yeah, I've talked to a hundred customers. They all say this, that's not really acceptable. Um, what I like to see is I've talked to a hundred customers and I've got this 10 page document where I typed out all of their qualitative um, responses. And I've got, yeah. And I've got uh, this other like survey thing where I've got all of their quantitative data from responses. So like to me, and like just the number of customers that they've talked to, that's the biggest thing for me at the traction stage because if they're focused really, really on that customer problem and they're diligent enough to do that, then that's a good indicator for me that they'll land on something. Might not be that one, but they'll land on something and they'll keep chasing the customer problem. <laughs> I love it. Jace, you agree? I really want to support and echo that. Yeah, like in Startmate, the whole first week is like, like, how many times are you going to talk to your customer? You know, we even though we're a later stage company, you know, like sort of pre-series A, we changed our top focus for our whole company to doing 100 customer interviews, you know, in 12 weeks. And we learned so much. But it's really, really challenging to then take that all that information and make use of it, you know. But that's the goal of a startup is to learn 
Um, and the other thing for me as well, and I think this doesn't always get talked about, and what I see a lot with early stage companies is they have too many customers and too many problems. And when they talk, they're like, oh, I solve this problem, this problem, this problem, and I'm going to have enterprise, and I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have that. So for me, it's like, if you don't know who your first customer is, you need to be showing the investor that that's what you're trying to learn. And if you're talking to an investor and you've got multiple customers and you haven't really clearly articulated like which one's going to be the first one, I think you're going to have a really hard time getting getting investment. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree from the sentiments um, working with startups for the better part of five years now. Um, and we've got a few questions. I thought this would be a, a good one for you. A few questions. I think there's like maybe some uh, lack of clarity around like what's an angel, what's a VC, um, and what like the what the difference is and what they're like the differences in their investing. Do you mind giving a bit of a 101 on, yeah. on, on the differences and maybe the difference between like seed and series A more or less? Yeah, for sure. So an angel investor, cool name. It really just means, um, I think Jason was saying before, a high net wealth individual. So someone is, you know, putting their own funds and investing their own money in um, the startup world and really hoping for returns and, and hopefully backing a unicorn. Um, what that means though, because it's their own funds is they've got more flexibility um, around their investments. On the other side, you've got VCs, which are kind of funds that are grouped together with other people's money. So they'll have mandates and they'll have limited ability to, to um, invest in certain, certain areas or fields. And that's why I think Cheryl was saying before, you've got to really make sure you know if you're approaching an investor um, if it's a VC, that they can actually even invest in your startup. They might not be able to invest in certain types um, of, of startups. So that's like roughly VCs versus angel investors. Um, and in the earlier stages, you'll probably see a lot of angels playing in that field. So getting involved earlier on because they've got, um, you know, they've got, they might not be able to cut bigger checks in, in later rounds, but they can cut checks earlier on and then hopefully back a winner. Um, so they'll be playing around in the early like pre-seed rounds um whereas some vcs although increasingly in australia we are seeing vcs um, get involved earlier on they typically would probably wait for a bit more traction a bit more of a product to before they um before they invest great thank you so much and em i want to um i wanted to ask you you know i'm there's these things that are thrown around that i get questions on consistently like we, on a weekly basis like what is what does due diligence mean for my startup and people are often scared about it. They hear the word yeah. and they're like completely scared about it. So just, can you yeah. just like shed some light on what that is? For sure. I've done a lot of it in my time. Um, due diligence or DD. Um, so it's really just a process that investors are going to go through and they're going to undertake a review of your startup. And that review is going to help them to decide whether it's worth them investing. So what it means is um, usually a startup will just set up an online data room where they upload all of the key documents um, and materials that relate to that business. So that's things like financial documents, employee agreements, key customer um, or partnership agreements, lease agreements, and particularly IP, that's a really important one for investors. So you've got to upload all of those documents for investors to go through and review. Um, and you really need to make sure that you upload all of the important things. If you don't upload something that's actually really critical for an investor to make a decision, you're actually going to get yourself into a bit of legal trouble, trouble down the track and they could bring some legal action because that basically investors are going to decide on whether to invest based on that information. Um, and if you're ever unsure about what to include in a data room, um, just, just reach out to some advisors who can really guide you on what to include and, and help you set up your data room. I love it. Um, thanks, Em. Jace, uh, I want to ask you, this is such an interesting one. I think a lot of early, in the early stage, sometimes getting evaluation um, for my startup can be a little bit of a guess. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how, like, as an early stage startup, I should start to go about valuing my company? Absolutely. I think this is one of the hardest things for founders, as you say. And the, the, the lucky thing is that it's actually really easy if you just follow, like, a simple sort of procedure. So, the first answer, which is really, really hard to do in the beginning, is to know that you just need to work out how much money you need and then how much dilution you want to do. And then that's approximately what your startup is worth. Now, of course, you can't say I want to raise $10 million for a seed company. So it needs to be within reason. 
but there's there's these buckets that investors just expect you to fit into. You know, like there's a, a rough valuation range for pre-seed, there's a rough valuation range for seed and for Series A, right? So if you need a million dollars for the next 18 months, so the first thing you need to work out is how much capital you need always. Like, what do I need to reach my next set of milestones within, say, an 18-month period? So you work that out. It needs to be a reasonable amount for the stage that you're at because there's only like a, like a normally like a range of capital that you can actually raise. So, you know, just say for argument's sake, seed round, $1 million. Um, I, I, can, I can reach some significant milestones with this $1 million. Say for argument's sake, $1 million in ARR. And therefore, and I don't want to dilute my company more than 20%, so I'm happy to take $4 million pre-money valuation, right? So that's that's the simplest way to do it. And good good tech investors, they know this. They understand this. Bad tech investors, they'll run you through the ringer. They'll have your five-year model out. They'll be pointing at every number in your five-year model. And they'll be really like just punishing you um, over every little number. You need to try and avoid that because that's not really valuable to you or the investor or anybody. So now having said that, there are some specific valuation methods that you can use. So the simplest one for pre-seed for the very first round is the Berkus method. This saves so many problems in the beginning. Normally you're like, how much equity do I give my co-founder or how much equity do I give my first hire? And and how do I give equity to my, to my advisors? And, and how do I get, you know, some money out of my friends and family? You know what I mean? It's a really, really tricky time. You just use the Berkus method. So essentially you ask five simple questions to, uh, about your company. Um, so it's like, where's my MVP at? How good's my team? How good are my strategic partnerships? You know, so there's five simple questions. You give yourself a score between one and 10 for each of those. And then, each of those factors has a maximum of half a million dollars. So you can have a maximum valuation of two and a half million dollars. Now the Berkus method will save you so much time and, and hassle and heartache. Uh, and I really highly recommend it. Now, once you get a little bit later stage um, after say the pre-seed round, then you would normally do um, like, you can just value your company by stage. Like literally I've got this valuation canvas that I can share. And there's just these rules of thumb. Are you pre-revenue? Are you post-revenue? Is your revenue growing? And then you just basically pull a number out of the air between like zero and $10 million. And you value yourself at that. Um, like it, there really is some fast ways to do valuation that are not super technical, that don't cost 10 grand or whatever, you know, like from, from some wizard. Because when you're a startup, you don't know anything anyway. <laughs> so like every single number in your model, or like so many of them are assumptions. You're better off using rules of thumb. Um, so I do have a, a canvas on that that I can share. There's like four different methods. Um, make the stuff really, really straightforward for you. I love that, Jace. Um, I love the offer to share resources. Um, I think it's, it's a great way to provide value to everyone on the call. Cheryl, I want to ask you, um, often early stage startups are like totally freaked out by this concept of dilution. Like I'm, I'm losing control. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about like, what are your thoughts there? Like, how, how can I like start to frame that in my mind if I'm an early stage founder? Yeah. So there's generally two top reasons why founders are scared to dilute. The first is that sense of loss of control and, oh, I'm not going to get to make de decisions about my business. So for that one, I, my, my biggest thing is make sure you know who you're getting into bed with, like pick the right people so that that isn't something that you necessarily have to stress about and make sure that you get the right structures in place that protect you and your right to make decisions as a board member, um, as a shareholder and whatever else you need to. Emma can probably uh, give you a much deeper uh, explanation as to how to do that, but it's really not that difficult. Like your standard shareholders agreements, your IP assignment deeds, whatever else, um, the documents that all go into your uh, data room. So make sure you know how, who you're getting into bed with. Don't just pick people because they have money and get the right structures in place. So that's that deals with the loss of control. The other one is, uh, the other main reason I hear is that, oh, I, I want to make sure I have a big exit. So it's about the money. My answer to that is, well, you can either have a huge piece of a very small pie that may not have any exit at all and could just end up turning into a lifestyle business, 
or you can have, wait, was the other way? You can have a very big piece of a very small pie, or you can have a smaller piece of a very, very, very big pie. And if you pick the right people that you want to get involved in your business, that are going to help you scale and grow and achieve the outcomes and the results that you want to achieve, then that pie could grow very, 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 very big. And it really won't matter uh, whether you got diluted from, you know, 50% to 40%. And I think when you realize what some of these founders are uh, at the end days, like, you know, what, um, you know, Travis and some of the big, uh, big tech companies that we have in our daily lives. Now, if you look at where they ended up at the very end, they're really not high numbers, but that's okay. Cause they're having like these $10 billion exits. And so even like a 2% equity stake in your company that you might've founded five years ago or 10 years ago is still a huge number. So you really need to think about like, what is valuable to you? And are you looking to get that exit? Uh, or are you really concerned about making sure that you have the right to control your company now and into the future? And there are ways that you can mitigate both of those risks. And really like, there's a hard limit, like maybe like don't give away 50% of your business, but, <laughs> and generally a good rule of thumb, um, like Jason said, is um, you don't want to give away more than 20% in one round. But outside of that, like if you want, if you need to get the right people involved, and you need to dilute in order to do that, like, don't be scared that you're not going to get a big enough exit or you're going to give up control because those are things that you can absolutely deal with. Great. That's, um, it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, I think dilution is a scary thing, but when you realize you, you, that you're going to get a larger, a smaller piece of a larger pie, then it starts to all click into place. Um, something that is really an interesting fact is I think the, U the founder of the USB had like 4% of his company by the time that he sold, but he was not worried because we all know how ubiquitous the um, USB is today. So yeah. <laughs> he was really not too concerned about that whole piece. Em, I want to throw it to you because Cheryl raised something interesting there about maintaining control um, and something that people are scared, very scared about. I'm giving away part of my business. What happens to like all the control? Can you tell us, how do I control it? Can you tell us yeah, what's going on? Absolutely. Give a better and explanation than I did. <laughs> no, I'm just going to double the down document. on that point. You, <laughs> you have a legal doc sitting behind it. But yeah, I think it's a massive misconception that um, the number of shares or the percentage that you hold in a company directly equates to the control of the company. It's not always the case. And it's actually the legal documents that sit behind the company that everyone agrees to that determines how the company is controlled. Um, it will link back to the percentages, but you can kind of play around with whether that's shareholding percentage and that dictates certain decisions. Or usually what we see is like the board is actually making most of the decisions of the company because you don't want to be going to all shareholders for all this like decisions of the company. It's just not practical. So you really got to just make sure you're structuring your board properly and the decision making of the board makes sense. It's going to work. It's not going to be too onerous. Um, and when you bring investors into the mix, you often have to be negotiating and this is part of the the negotiation process before you, you um, get the investment over the line is what, what involvement are they having? Are they going to sit on your board? Are they going to have veto rights over certain decisions? Or are they going to be really passive and maybe just have an observer seat? So they're the kind of discussions that really play into the control of the company, not so much the share. Obviously, it's important to keep an eye on how much you're diluting by, but really paying close attention to the board and who's having a say on the decisions and the direction of the company. That's really critical. Thanks, Em. I um, want to um, throw it over to you, Jace. We've had, got a question from Amanda um, saying, um, what are your views on founder salaries when you're seeking investment? Um, yeah, what do you reckon? Yeah, look, they really can't be too high. Um, I think a lot of our investors place a lot of importance on the founder's ability to dig deep and sacrifice for the good of their company. Um, so for example, like you do need to, you do need to earn a living and I don't think founders should earn nothing. Like there have been a couple of times when the founders at Cake have had to earn nothing, like to like get us to the next round. And so we could pay our, it can happen. And I think you have to have the mindset that you might have to do that from time to time. And, and you build a lot of respect with your investors when you do that, but you do, I don't think that should be the starting point. I think founders should be able to, to earn. I think right in the beginning, like right in the beginning before your first round and, and even perhaps maybe like until you sort of get to see maybe you're not getting paid. Like I think right in the beginning, it can be hard to take a salary. Maybe you're just taking like just some meager amount, like four or five K a month or something like that, just to be really practical. And from my experience, and then 
maybe once you start getting your, your revenue and you get some growth and you get your seed round done then you bump it up to just like a good like low salary <laughs> you know like depending on what city you're in you know like maybe it's like six eight k a month or whatever and you just like you can you can pay the bills you're not going backwards too much but you're not really draining the company and then I really think it should stay around that level until you really start like post series A and things are really pumping and, and then you can perhaps start to like normalize it out with with like proper salaries. But unfortunately for the first few years, it's got to be pretty minimal and you have to be prepared to to just um, cope. <laughs> like or, That's what I really think. And I've seen this a lot and I've talked to a lot of investors and, and um, you know, it's a thing, but it, it also gives you a lot of um, satisfaction when you make it and it makes you feel really good when, when you really dig deep and you get through those tough times. And then, and then when things are going good, you, you, you know, you feel better about everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that, Jason. I think like it's important to note uh, from my experience that with investors that they don't want to see you suffer or drown either. So they do want to see you be able to pay rent, eat food. So you're not expected to sacrifice everything but in those tough times totally you, know, you have to make totally. a call totally totally and they because if your mental health is too bad and you can't focus then you can't really deliver for your startup as well so it definitely is a balance and everyone has their own situation but i think like a, a good fair salary that's not too high i think is okay like i've seen a couple of founders on like you know 130 to 150 and when it gets to that level like if it's like seed stage maybe series a like it does come up in uh in investors discussions about like are these too high um we also did have in our we did have a limit put on uh, like a, a maximum amount that our total remuneration could get to um of 150k so that's just to share um with people what um what's in investors minds and where their mindsets can be so just sharing a bit of our experience there like not that that's like what every investor is going to think but yeah no, I love it. Um, thanks, Jace, um, for being open with us and sharing that. I am um, Cheryl. What I see you um, doing frequently publicly, and I know we've chatted about it privately as well, is like um, your the amount of pitch decks that you help people with and pitching pitching things. I wanted to get um, a view from you. Like, what is a pitch deck? When is the and when is the right time to start using it? Yeah, totally. I'm probably going to get an influx of um, pitch deck feedback. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I've, re I've really dug a hole for you. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I'm I'm happy to. Uh, I don't. You, if you want to enable the chat, I'm happy to post my email there. Um, if you send me your pitch deck, I will review it at some point. Uh, and anyway, so look, I the thing I love about pitch decks is really you tend not to actually need it for the majority of the capital raising process. However, if you don't create one, you don't get to that point. <laughs> There's two reasons. One is because if you don't have the ability to, or just haven't done so, to actually sit down and synthesize, what is the problem? How do I articulate it? Who is my customer? How do I communicate my business model? How do I do all of the things and communicate it in a, in a succinct 10 to 20 page pitch deck? It's unlikely that you're going to be able to communicate it properly verbally and be able to get past that initial meeting. The second reason is generally the very first thing that an investor asks is send me your pitch deck. What they in fact mean is they mean your email readable version of your investor deck. Uh, not your pitch deck. So uh, you, depending on what you want to do in order to get funding, you may want to go up on stage um, at an event, uh, say a pitch competition and actually pitch to an audience. That is your pitch deck. That's the thing that you pitch with. It's your visual representation of the things that you're saying. And that one is very, very visual. Now, occasionally uh, what people will send me when they want feedback on their pitch deck is that very thing. And generally I'll see like photo, one word, photo, like a chart. And I'll be like, I have, I, I have zero concept of what you're trying to convey to me here because this isn't readable. It needs you to talk along with it, which is great for when you're on stage because it helps you tell a story and you can get people to focus on you. Uh, what in fact most investors want before they uh, set up a meeting with you is they want an email version of your, essentially it's kind of like your business plan. Like what's the problem you're solving? Who are you solving it for? How are you going to get those customers? What are they going to pay you once you get them? What does the future look like? What's your vision here? So that's something that all needs to be communicated very concisely in a completely standalone readable slide deck. Generally somewhere around 10, 10 slides is great. 
Um, anything longer than that, I start to get bored. Uh, anything shorter than that, you may actually, I've seen, I've seen really great, like two page ones where I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm in, let me, let me hear. Um, but that's, that's kind of the exception, not the rule. So look, uh, it, it's good to have different versions of uh, your investor pitch deck because you will go through different um, stages. And sometimes investors will ask you just for a, like a one pager that they can pass on. Uh, other times uh, they might ask you for a much more detailed version. The other document that sometimes you'll be requested is the IM, the investment memo, um, or in the US is the private placement memo, I think. Uh, that's the like much longer 50 to 100 page version of essentially still your business plan, um, but more in written format with less visuals. Uh, and that is a really good one once you get a bit later stage. I've invested just off pitch decks, um, obviously meeting the founder, but like very little documentation past that um, other than the core stuff of like, do you have a shareholders agreement? Uh, so yeah, the, the, the amount of times that you will need to actually pitch using your pitch deck is actually not that many. Like even the big VCs, many of them won't require you to do a formal uh, like in-person presentation pitch where you go through your pitch deck as if you are presenting to an audience. Most of them will actually, it's much more of an interactive conversation back and forth over the couple of weeks that you'll be doing that DD with them. Um, so like I said, it's you kind of can't get there without it, but you rarely, unless you're going to a pitch event, will need to live pitch your pitch deck. Yeah, Jace, is your, is your kind of experience fairly similar? You went through Startmate, you obviously had a big pitch at the end of it with a pitch deck and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but has your experience with investors been similar in the sense that um, you're oh, rarely man. pitching the formal full pitch? It's been such a wild journey and I've done so many different things that I've been trying to work this out for like years and I'm not, I'm really not sure uh, how I'm, how I'm doing it now and what I've learned and what I've come to is um, like you have two, I call them both pitch decks. I have a short one and a long one. So as Cheryl says, you have like a short one, which is like the pretty emotive one with big words, how I normally use that and how I would describe people to use that and what start mates sort of taught us is that's the one you send out like when you're trying to get meetings that's the first one you send so hey here we're cake we're awesome this is why we're awesome few bullet points and here's our here's our overview deck uh we'd love to catch up you know um would you be interested in a meeting sort of thing so we, we would normally use that first high level deck to to get to the second like get to second base or whatever to get to the second stage um then i would have like more like a 30 or 40 page deck um and why i do the 30 page deck is um because like an i am is a huge overhead for a startup like to do a 50 to 100 page document is a massive undertaking and i really wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy unless like you had like 100 grand to pay to someone else to do it for you which you can do when you're later but like they're so expensive they're so time consuming so i find this bigger deck like the 30 page deck to be a good happy medium where you can you can share a lot more context and information with the investors. Uh, and then I normally, so how, what I would then do with that deck and what I did for my raise is I actually pitch that deck. I have about 15 pages in the bit that I pitch and then I have all the rest in the appendix. So all the, and then if they happen to ask a question, that's about something. And then I've got a page in the appendix. I can go bam and I can just show this page and it makes you look like super boss in the meeting when you've got this with all these really strong pre-prepared answers um, to their questions. And so that's how I do it. Double pitch deck, like a light one and a heavy one. I do pitch my deck almost every time because it keeps me on point. I try and keep the pitch so about 10, 15 minutes because then you've always got like at least 30 to 45 minutes for the Q&A. Um, and then, yeah, so that's how I do it. But um, like, I think, you know, the way Cheryl described it was equally good and it's a super, super, um, artful sort of thing so take all of that and make your own way with it i reckon <laughs> it's less science more art and i think that's way like, more art <laughs> um, I guess that's like the thing is like the early stage right so you're not really you're not really going on the basis of like any strong data or any strong way to, one way to do things and there are so many different ways to do things um but there are some like broad uh, overarching tips that do help help um you know just kind of figure it out like your your canvas jace that you mentioned before that can sometimes think when things get a little bit confusing and um, i want to hear from you you work with founders and investors all the time what are some of your tips i guess for nailing that first meeting with investors you're meeting them for the first time and my assumption is that first impressions matter what should i do yeah absolutely that what we always tell our startups is preparation is everything 
really do your research, make sure you know everything about that investor so that you can put your best foot forward, ask the right questions. So like anything that's available on the internet about that investor, um, you know, read up, read their LinkedIn, Google them, see what articles they've written. So you can really like, it shows so well that the investor doesn't think that they're always wasting their time. Um, and if they've gone to the effort to like actually meet up with you, it's a really good sign. So you've got to really make the most of it. So preparation um, is everything. Yeah, I love it. Just simple, quick and simple. Just make sure you're prepared. <laughs> I'm sure Cheryl is nothing more frustrating than coming to a meeting and someone doesn't even know who you who you are or why they're meeting with you. Um, so as an investor, you know, I think it it, it shows it shows a lot uh, if you just have your your shit together. Don't mind my French, and then it makes you look more more confident just by virtue of that of that happening. Um, we're almost like done. So I just wanted to get. Um, you know, my favorite part of any of any discussion is talking about some horror stories. So <laughs> maybe not personal, but you know, th things that you've seen done wrong. Jace, is there anything that comes to mind for you? Things that when you've seen things go wrong in the early stages? Yeah, like the worst possible outcome is that you don't get, that you run out of money, right? And so I think the number one way to run out of money is to like prepare poorly for your raise. And um, so I'm going to be specific. So one of the worst things you can do is not know enough investors and not build enough investor relationships. And you've got all your rounds like on one investor who says they're keen or whatever, and they're in, right? Even if you've got a signed term sheet, but not perhaps not if you've got a signed term sheet because they really, really should close. But sometimes you still see it, especially with angels and family offices and stuff that aren't, aren't, and don't have as much experience and professionalism. But for me, like, make sure you've got enough investors um, and that the investors that you're working with actually invest. You know, like there's a lot of angels out there that haven't done a lot of investing and I'm not really criticizing them. It's just like, it's really the founder's responsibility to make sure that they're, um, they're talking to the right people and that they're managing this risk well enough um, that they've got the right investor, got enough investors, they're getting into it early enough so they're not going to run out of money because you know, it's a, it's a really bad outcome. Yeah, I love it. So just not talking to investors soon enough. And what about you? What are some things that you've seen go wrong that are totally avoidable? Well, there's a few things, but um, I think number one is um, just not freaking out. I think particularly for first time founders going through the investment process, it can be really kind of consuming and a little bit stressful, um, a bit confusing. But um, I think that, you know, we see founders get a bit stressed out about negotiating terms with investors and getting, you know, investment deadlines um, completed in time. But I kind of, my biggest piece of advice is really just to, you know, back the advisors you've got with you. They've seen it this a thousand times, bring them in earlier rather than later so they can really help you set up and make sure you are prepared and do have the right amount of time because there's nothing worse than seeing founders get really stressed, flustered and rushing into deal terms that aren't actually that great for them and have like long-term effects for them. But if they just took the time and, and was a bit, were a bit more level-headed, uh, it probably wouldn't have worked out that way. So um, yeah, being balanced and level-headed and just, you know, that's gonna set you up for success. And it's also gonna, you know, you're gonna have these investors on your cap table as shareholders on ongoing basis. So you wanna really set the relationship right, set the tone right, how they can respect the way that you deal with these things. Even if it's your first time, it will really reflect well. Awesome. So don't freak out. And Cheryl, some things you've got, seen gone wrong or like some avoidable things that you recommend for founders to not do? <laughs> to not do. Uh, yeah, lots of things. Don't fall in love with your product is probably the biggest one. Like I think a lot of you have thought of, oh, I've got this great idea. I've got a product idea. I'm going to build this and it's going to be amazing. If you fall in love with your product, I guarantee you, you're going to build something that nobody wants and nobody is willing to pay for. So rather than falling in love with your product and all the amazing features that you think it can have, um, whenever you find yourself thinking about your product, switch your thinking and think about the problem that you're solving. And if you're not sure what problem that you're solving, then that's a really good indication that you're not thinking about the right things and are probably setting yourself up for failure. So get really, really, really clear on what is the problem that you're solving. Solving, and then maybe think about for who <laughs> that's a good one so that's probably the next one so what problem are you solving and then who are you solving it for and then you can start to think about well 
how many people have this problem? What solutions might they appreciate? What solutions can I try to tackle this problem? Because I guarantee you the product and the solution that you've thought of where you haven't thought of the customer or the problem yet is not the right one. Um, and the other thing is that five, 10 years from now, not only will the product and the technology and anything else around that change, um, but the problem won't. So if you are five years from now and you're like, I am still in love with shipping DVDs to people all around the company or country and we're the best shipper of DVDs, uh, you're probably not going to be in a great place. However, if you're like, I want to make sure that anyone everywhere has access to the best content and movies and TV that they want to watch, no matter how we do that, you're probably still going to be around five to 10 years from now when you're still solving that problem just in super cool, innovative ways. By the way, I was talking about Netflix. <laughs> I love that. I actually, we run some school programs and I always like share this picture of like a Netflix CD and like black out the name Netflix. I'm like, do you know what company this started as? And they're always like totally freaked out that people used to watch movies on these CDs. <laughs> it's great. Um, all right, guys, rapid fire before we close off. One resource that you recommend for founders, Jace. Yeah, so I'm going to share with you my valuation canvas. You should definitely check it out. Um, yeah, but it's amazing. Cheryl, please say the investor list. <laughs> if not, I would say the Airtree open source investor list. It's amazing. Love it. Thanks. Uh, my, my list of everything. Um, Josh, can you enable the chat for attendees so that they can read um, the chat? Yeah, it should be enabled, but maybe I've done something totally wrong and it's not enabled. It seems like they can't see the chat. Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. I'll send it to you all after this anyway. So I'll share cool. all the resources we've mentioned today. Cool. I'll put my email here. And yeah, my list of resources. That's that's it. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. amazing <laughs> obviously, we know that. Um, and M, one, re one resource you recommend for founders? Yeah, even more old school um, and simple than a Google Doc is the book Venture Deals, going old yeah. school, reading a book again. It's just the best way. It's the first book that I read when I was coming into the startup world and trying to understand this space because it is very different from traditional commercial law. Um, but, you know, great insights into how VCs and investors, hey, there you go, as a puppy that Cheryl's got there. Um, yeah, just really worthwhile. You'll understand how equity works, what, what investors are looking for and the process. It's really good for the process to give that one read. I love it, guys. Looks thank like you. This. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your tips and joining us. Jace, I hope you had a lovely car ride uh, <laughs> and relaxing. <laughs> thanks, car guys. Ride. Guys, thanks so much for your time today. We'll um, share everything after this. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Legends. Bye. Guys. Bye.